as always it's a great uh, pleasure to you know have these conversations with you and our today's topic is the postmodern and the postcolonial which is really interesting uh, topic and to look at the intersectionality of the two and part of the reason i decided to choose this topic was because i got a couple of queries from some people from pakistan and india who are trying to write their dissertations or master's thesis and they are interested in knowing if they can use postmodernism within the uh, context of postcolonialism so i thought we should have a conversation about that so like our previous format uh, I will, um, you know, give my ideas about the topic and then, of course, hope that you'll have some questions. But in the meanwhile, if you can't hear me clearly, do let me know and I'll see what I can do. Um, okay. So uh, to start, uh, I was going to use Homi Baba's chapter from the location of culture to discuss this issue. And when I reread it, I realized that there is so much that needs to be unpacked in that chapter, uh, that there is no way I can handle it in a virtual session like that, especially if you haven't read it. But I do strongly recommend that you should read that chapter in the location of culture, because that is probably one of the most sophisticated debates about the post-colonial and the post-modern. But for our purposes, I think if we understand what do we mean when we say postmodern, and then if we understand what do we mean postcolonial and bring them together in conversation, then it's better for us to understand. Now, of course, if you are curious about postcolonialism and what are different ways of thinking it, imagining it, and practicing it, this is, of course, the course that we are running. Uh, this is the eighth session, so I do strongly recommend that you should watch the previous videos, but also my general lectures on uh, postcolonialism should be useful too. So we already know that postcolonialism, in one way or the other, always deals with issues of the colonial experience, the contact phase, the postcolonial phase, and while Colonialism isn't considered the originary moment of these cultures. It is considered uh, uh, an experience that has had huge impact on the post-colonial societies. And so most of the times the authors, the writers, the poets are either talking about the contact phase or about the struggles of liberation or about the impact that the colonization left on their cultures. All of this comes under post-colonial, but there is no single answer to what constitutes post-colonial. And anytime someone does that, they are reducing it to what they want to believe in the course, to be the post-colonial. And there are, of course, quite a few critiques of it, we, which we have discussed. But by and large, what we can agree on that most of the time, the po post-colonial text whether written by people living in the post colonies or in diaspora, deal with issues of immigration, marginality, identity, right? uh, colonial culture and its implications for the native cultures. Then within the post colonies, what's happening to women, what's happening to minorities, all of those issues form part of post colonial studies. And so knowing post-colonialism in that complexity is important. Now, postmodernism similarly is a highly contested term, right? Um, I have a couple of lectures on postmodernism, especially on Linda Hutchins' book, which I highly recommend. But by and large, what we do understand about postmodernism is that the post in postmodern doesn't necessarily mean that modernism has ended. Right, postmodernism doesn't have an episteme of its own. 
But there are certain things that happen in postmodernism. For example, the distinction of high and low literature is kind of abolished. What was previously considered popular literature becomes equally accessible and respectable within postmodernism. Then there is a lot of playfulness in postmodernist texts. They also play with issues of history, sometimes in a parody, which makes fun of history, sometimes in a kind of pastiche, which is respectful of history and rewrites it. Most postmodern texts are also self-reflexive. What that means is that they point to their own construction as you are reading the novel. Sometimes a novelist will say, you know, here is a novel, you are reading it, the novelist would address you. So all of these things coming together then form postmodernism as something that tweaks what was available in modernism, what modernism did, and then disrupts that. One important aspect of postmodernity, of course, is that there is no single narrative that we can rely on. So just as the narratives in the culture are usually built by the dominant groups, right, and then offered to us as the norm, as natural, that's exactly sort of what happens in modernism. But in postmodernism, there is kind of a multi vocal literary production because the minorities are writing, because the women are writing, because other people who were previously excluded are also adding their voices to it. In terms of genre, since the distinction between high and low culture has been eliminated, so what would previously be considered bad literature, right, because it wasn't high enough, is equally as worthy of our respect and people study it. So comic books, right, videos, uh, cartoons, they become worthy of our study. So all of these things coming together then constitute kind of a sense of the postmodern. Now, of course, the most important book is Leotard's The Postmodern Condition, right? But do keep in mind that Leotard later repudiated that work. He basically said that this is the most terrible book I've ever written. But one of the main idea that we get from Leotard is this idea that, that society can no longer sustain um, grand narratives upon which different cultures were built, grand narratives of religion, grand narratives of rationality, reason, identity, and they are now being replaced by petite narratives, the smaller narratives. And Keeping that in mind is crucial in understanding postmodernism. There is, of course, a challenge to that, and we'll talk about it. So let me welcome people. So we have Akshali, welcome. Uh, Infinita, welcome. Oroko, um, great, welcome from Kenya. Uh, and then we have Dr. Asif, welcome for joining us. Cool. A lot of eminent people have joined us today. Okay, so, um, so if we roughly have an idea of what we understand by post-colonialism, not a very strictly constituted term, and post-modernism as a diffused term with varied connotations, but some similarities within the studies of post-modernism as well. Then what we are de dealing with is when we bring the two together, we are bringing two deeply complex and indeterminate terms together. And so the result would be complex and nuanced and not really stable. So how does it play in post-colonial studies? I mean, if you look at, just as we cannot actually assume what exactly is post-colonialism, you know, no one can tell you, oh, here, this is what post-colonialism is, right? Um, so when we look at the intersectionality of the two, then we have to look at, first of all, the works of post-colonial authors loosely brought together and see whether or not they are writing a realistic novel <coughs> or they are writing 
a modernist novel or maybe they're writing a postmodernist novel. But before we go into that, I had mentioned that postmodernism, there are some interesting debates about it. The idea of the grand narratives dying out and petite narratives taking over, to me, is a very Eurocentric idea. <coughs> so, uh, I have a question here from Davina. Do you have any more material on Occidentalism? No, I don't. Uh, I don't believe in the term. I think it is a right-wing consp conspiracy theory term coming from American right. Yeah, I don't think that Occidentalism exists, and that's what I recorded a video on. But other than that, I don't have books or materials on it. Uh, so, I mean, the reason I contest this idea of grand narratives dying and being replaced by relativistic, maybe, uh, petite narratives is that um, in the post colonies, actually, the, it's a reversal of that. Uh, wherever you go in the post colonies, there is a reprisal of religious ways of looking at life, which, of course, offers a universalistic view of the world, of the hereafter. There is a constant reactionary response here to postmodernism. And that is the reliance increasingly on religious doctrines, religious texts, on pushing against the egalitarian, maybe, or democratic, or multifarious push of postmodernism and, and retrieving back into the orthodoxies, theological views of the world. So there is an increase in the world on reliance on grand narratives, maybe as a reaction to the extremes of postmodernism. That's my reading of it, and you can correct me on that. That is why when in the 19, late 1990s, when I was preparing for my master's exams, uh, when I went looking for books in a local bookstore on postmodernism, the first books that were written were actually written by, by pastors, by uh, you know, evangelical Christians because they posit postmodernism as this godless world in which there are no morals and nothing else, right? And they were writing against it. So anytime someone writes anything against an idea, postcolonialism and postmodernism, do keep in mind that they make it into something that they can attack. It's a straw man argument usually. So similarly, if you go to Pakistan, right? Uh, what talk of postmodernism, we are still trying to defend modernism. So the religious people will basically make the West into this something where anything goes, right? And against that, they will juxtapose their own so-called pure, um, you know, uh, humanity or their own solution to world's problems. If you go to India, uh, there is a lot of focus on dharma, uh, these days from the right-wing Hindus who are absolutely not just offering that Hinduism is a greater way of life, but who are saying that this is the only way of life. So uh, in a way, then the reactionary responses to the democratization of the public sphere are actually stronger at this time. Now, what Baba discusses in his chapter is the, not the peripheral nature of post-colonial work uh, in terms of post-modernism, but its very centrality, right? How does he argue that what he's talking about initially, and this is a very complex deb debate that I'm just simplifying, uh, maybe at the cost of the original work, uh, what he talks about is that the original explanations of post-modernism are pretty Eurocentric. Right, but look at what happens in postmodernism. The issues of cultural difference become huge. The ex the extra voices that are being added to the narrative of modernism. Where are they coming from? From women, right? Uh, from you know people with different sexualities, but also from the migrants and immigrants. These are the people 
who are articulating a new mode of representation and thinking, which is neither this, neither where they came from, nor fully assimilated in the dominant culture. So what emerges out of the, that is an indeterminate way of looking at metropolitan cultures and, and, and kind of a hybrid way of representing truth or reality. So I think what he's doing is he's making the post-colonial cultural, cultural production central to the project of postmodernism, and And that is crucial to keep in mind. Right. If you ever read anything about postmodernism, one thing you already know is that this idea of periphery and the center, I mean, if you look at it mathematically, you know, the center cannot exist without the periphery. The only reason we know the center of a circle is because we imagine a periphery. That means that the periphery determines the center, right? Yeah, the term in postmodernism is constitutive otherness, right? That myself as it is, is constituted by my other, right? You have to go to Saussurian linguistics for that. So now if we look at, and I'm going to finish my thought and then take a look at your questions and see uh, what can I do in terms of answering them. Uh, uh, so by and large, if you look at postmodernist production from the postcolonial authors, you will see that mostly uh, it's the diasporic authors who are actually, in a way, delving more into postmodernism. I mean, the greatest example, of course, is Salman Rushdie. When you read Midnight's Children, right, um, the way the narrative is 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 broken the way history is sometimes satirically retold the way the historical characters sometimes emerge in the novel all of those are postmodernist tropes right and you see them but not all postcolonial novels are postmodernist i mean there are novels that are pretty stable they tell a realistic stories so if you look at the postmodern canon or uh, a postcolonial canon if you pick up Ngugi Tiango, read The Devil on the Cross. It's a realistic leftist novel. You pick up Bushi Emechita's Joys of Motherhood, another realistic political novel, right? Uh, uh, God of Small Things, Arundhati Roy, right? Maybe modernist, right? Maybe limit modernist text. Uh, depending on uh, quite a lot of novels being written by Pakistani authors, you know, Mohsen Hamid and others are mostly modernist novels, other than Exit West, which becomes slightly postmodernist, right? So, one uh, way of looking at postmodernism, and this comes from Brian McHale, who, who has a bo book on postmodernist fiction, is this idea that modernism has if you were to articulate uh, an episteme for modernism, the modernist novel was epistemological dominant. And the postmodernist novel, in his view, is ontological dominant. What does it mean? That in a modernist novel, the question is always of knowing, right? You, uh, it's, a, it's a question of knowledge, right? So you're trying to figure out whether you can trust the narrator, whether you can trust the story or the characters. You're curious, there is a secret at the heart of a modernist novel and you go and discover it, right? But by carefully reading what the narrator is saying. In the postmodernist novel, what he suggests is that the quest is about existence. The questions that we are asking are not, is this true? The questions that we are asking are, is this the only existence? Are there alternative worlds? Are, are there alternative universes, right? So the question is about existence, about ontology, right? And if we keep that in mind, that kind of gives us another tool to differentiate between a modernist text and a postmodernist text. But then when we go to postcolonialism, we find out that there is a range of temporalities and range of forms and genres. Some postcolonial authors are writing in the postmodern sense, the novels that they write are short stories. Some of them are still writing realistic novels, 
some of them are still writing modernist novels. It, it doesn't matter. We cannot think, oh, they are behind, right? No. It's a question of choice. What kind of a novel would you write? It doesn't mean that somehow there is a monolithic thing called the post-colonial novel and somehow it can be postmodern. And then what kind of a postmodernism is it? Is it, is it the postmodernism as defined by people over here, right? Or are there postmodernisms peculiar to different postcolonial nation states or cultures or regions? Baba would say that postcolonialism is not national because it is transnational. And similarly, postmodernism cannot really be restrained into, even if you're telling the story of an immigrant community from Nigeria, from Kenya, in New York, you are telling a global story which, which is consumed globally, shared globally, and has implications for a global you know, world, right? So, so, so in that sense, the post-colonial writer living in the metropolitan, writing their fiction, is writing about a nation past or present, but in that sense uh, is creating a new future which can be shared in planetary terms. Okay, so I have one question. Uh, what are some errors of Said's Orientalism? Sorry, uh, I can't really answer that. But if you follow our uh, series on Edward Said, those would come up. Uh, most of the times, the errors that people impugn to Said are the errors that they themselves invent uh, because they haven't read all of Said. So uh, I have Sayani here. Uh, from India, how should someone new to post-colonial and post-modern theories approach them? Which theorists or books should one start with? Thank you. Okay, so for post-colonialism, of course, pick up any reader. I highly recommend, um, you know, uh, this one, Robert Young's post-colonialism, which I think is the most comprehensive uh, uh, Leela Gandhi has another beautiful book on post-colonialism. And mostly I use Ania Lumba's book on post-colonialism. So what these three books, any of them would be useful, will do for you is give you the basic introduction to it. As far as post-modernism is concerned, I will, uh, for my own students, what I recommend is uh, there are these comic book versions on theory. And let me it's a, they, they have published them like a, this is on Derrida, this is on Nietzsche. So there is a whole set of them available. I'll post a link to it on my, when this edited version of this and you, uh, lecture is posted. Start from there. But the most comprehensive book on postmodernism, which actually tries to theorize postmodernism clearly, is Linda Hutchian's book. A poetics of postmodernism. You can start from there and see which debates she talks about and how it goes about. A lot of people mentioned to me MacLeod's book too. I haven't read it. If it's a good description of post-colonialism, go ahead, use it because, you know, as long as it can give you the basic debates. Now, one thing I would recommend is do not please rely only on uh, Empire Writes Back. That is a dated book. It's a heavily challenged book. And some of the some assertions that they make in there, you know, are problematic. Okay, so Mary, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, okay, then I have uh, AC. Thank you. It's so, and I would love to hear you speak more on how comparatists are working with postmodernism and the diaspora. Well, I mean, my own mentor, Dr. Robin Goodman, was trained as a comparatist. Gayatri Spivak is a comparatist, was trained as a comparatist. So if you go uh, just to Spivak's work, especially her um, lectures, which were published as Death of a Discipline, she will basically explain to you where her thought is and what does she think of comparative literature and how it needs to be um, you know, altered. And that is where 
she also theorizes her concept of planetarity, right? And the need for comparative literature to, to kind of leave its Eurocentric focus. Uh, that's all I can recommend. But most of the times, the early professors of post-colonial studies who got hired, because there were universities were not offering PhDs in post-colonial studies, were actually the scholars of comparative literature. I mean, Saeed was a comparatist. I mean, think of the major theorists of post-colonial studies. Two out of the three major theorists are were tra trained as comparatists. So keep that in mind. Who challenges empire, right, empire rights back? I mean, um, uh, if you just look at the second lecture that we did in this series, Anne McClintock, Ella Schwatt, in 1992 uh, are challenging its assumptions. Well, what I'm saying is that these were good scholars. They are still great scholars, you know, Helen Tiffin and Bill Ashcroft, but they are Commonwealth scholars. I think they did a great service to post-colonial studies by, um, you know, preparing uh, the key terms. But Empire writes back uh, its assumptions about English language and, and that they don't make the distinction between settler colonialism and occupational colonialism is a huge debate. Now, I don't know who exactly challenges that, but I can tell you that in my years of teaching post-colonial studies, I have never seen or heard anyone use the Empire Rights Back as a text in their classroom, right? As a text that explains post-colonialism because theory and practice of post-colonialism has moved way beyond that. I'm not denying the significance of their work, but I think compared to you know, people like Spivak, Baba, Edward Said, um, contemporary scholars of post-colonial studies, their work is, you know, slightly dated. So I am personally deeply opposed to us versus them kind of scholarship. I will challenge the power of the metropolitan cultures, United States, Britain, or anyone else, but I will not hesitate to challenge the corruptions of the post-colonial nation state itself. So uh, as long as you don't posit, you know, the magical native, right? As long as we're not saying that West is bad and East somehow has the answers to all the problems. Uh, so I think the question in the end is to change the world, right? Change the world how? so that the Western scholars do not think that their present is universal, right? That anything else that they look at is temporally behind them. But on the other hand, that's why hybridity is so important in Baba. On the other hand, encouraging our native cultures or places where we came from, encouraging the scholars over there to not get caught up into us versus them binary, right? But rather saying, what is it that we can learn ourselves and then infuse it with local knowledges and then force the metropolitan to account for that knowledge? So it depends on what your politics is. Are you a post-structuralist, post-colonialist? Are you a feminist? Are you a Marxist? Depending on that, there is no single end goal. But a list of things you want to do. You want to complicate the hegemony of the Western system of education or Western reason or Western simply ways of assuming certain truths to be universal. But at the same time, you have the responsibility to complicate the debates and challenge the debates with your own native cultures. Uh, the kind of post-colonialism that is being done especially in Pakistan and some parts of India, actually uh, is, in my opinion, uh, does a disservice to students. Because if you tell them you don't need to know the Western canon, just keep reading your Ghalib and Iqbal. No. The way you challenge the Western canon is, is by knowing it, right? And then by inserting your own knowledges into it. But that's post-colonialism. If you go to decolonialism and decolonial theorists like Walter Manvolo and uh, Arturo Escobar and all these people, what they are trying to challenge is the Western reason itself, right? And the Western cosmologies. And the idea is, can we think of a different way 
can we come up with a different mode of reasoning, right, which is not instrumental and maybe which gives us a different logic of looking at the world and nature. And so that's, I think, a, a completely different but a more ambitious project. Uh, so these are some of the things that we aspire to uh, as post-colonial scholars, but depending on which region we specialize in, you know, what theories we have learned and read and what we are trying to theorize the end goal. I mean, if there could be one end goal, that would be to make a more just and humane world, right? But then it's not just the prov province of post-colonialists. Every humanist at the end of the day is trying to do that, right? Um, Okay, good. So Sonia Shah welcomes. Do you think that we also try to sell our images as exotic and when we are seen as exotic, we object to it? I, I, I am not as cynical as that. You know, self is performative. You know, when you live in your own culture, native culture, part of what you do in the public sphere is to, you know, to to meet the faces that you meet. I mean, self in a, in a very sense is performative. Uh, are, are we sometimes over-determined by the demands of the market in our writing? Yes, we are, but then everyone is, right? Um, there is no harm in writing stories about your own culture if you live in New York. The question is, at the end of the day, and that's the question that I always ask, you know, I will criticize the dictators anywhere without any uh, hesitance. If I have to write a novel about Pakistan, it will tell all the terrible stories of Pakistan, the patriarchy, you know, all the ills. But at the same time, I will also try to share the story of what is beautiful about Pakistan. What is, what is it that I can be proud of? What is it that can give us hope? That's where I intervene in Pakistan. Otherwise, I'm not as cynical as saying these people are trying to paddle exotica to, I mean, the authors have a right to, you know, their authorial freedom. Uh, and I am no one to say you shouldn't write that. As a critic, I will challenge it if I find that it is disastrous or destructive. Um, but as in terms of selling your own self, you know, even if, when you're in your own native culture, you are selling your own self. You know, you're selling your skills. You're, every time you interview and try to tell someone, I can do this job that is marketing yourself. We teach our students to do that. So why shouldn't the authors try to market their commodity, which is their fiction and writing? So as I always say, I, I am very opposed to staunch binary views. You know, uh, even when I criticize American foreign policy, and I'm on record for that, I never fail to acknowledge the decency and humanity and compassion of millions of Americans, you know, who don't stand for that kind of um, imperial policy. So I don't lump them with, I create a space so that I acknowledge their kindness, their generosity, their compassion. And I think that's a better kind of scholarship. Harun Khan, how a nation can get rid of neo-colonial elite class as they set the rules and principles in their interest. And how would you explain discourse that is run by the elite? That's a very complex question. I don't think so I can answer it. Uh, how do you dislodge them will depend on your politics. If you're a leftist Marxist like me, you know, you'll have your politics, you'll have your way of writing. Within Marxism, it will depend who do you follow. Are you a Trotskyite? Are you a Leninist, right? Uh, do you follow, uh, you know, Antonio Gramsci? Depending on who you read, which praxis mode you learn will depend on how you want to change the world. I am an academic. I'm a professor, uh, right? Uh, if it comes to activism, fighting for someone's rights here, you know, Muslim ban, gays and lesbians, everyone else, I will go and stand with them in the street, right? I will lend my body to that cause. But in the long run, the way I want to change the world is through my work, little by little. That's where 
I somewhat agree with the scholar of de- scholarship of detachment that you keep producing a body of work, that it does something in the world. Now, if you really want to learn how to change the world through education, uh, I mean, you cannot be a professor without having read Paulo Freire. I highly recommend it. Read it carefully. See what kind of road does he construct for pedagogy. Um, we have a lecture series on it. I highly recommend you watch it. But these questions, these kind of questions, you know, what is your solution to the world's problem? No, I don't have a solution to the world's problem. problems. What I do is say I would like to change the world, and here is how I would like to do it, but it can't be a conclusive method or answer. No one has that answer, you know, unless you want to rely on a religion. Is there a way out of ethnocentric knowledge? Yeah, of course. I mean, where does the ethnocentric knowledge come from? From an idea of self, right? How I define myself, right? How is identity formed? And if you read Mark Brocker and people like um, Eric Erickson, the people who have researched identity, Most of the times our identities are formed on self-serving narratives. These are the stories that we have internalized, ideas that we believe in, right? Ethnocentric identity is built on those ideas. I'm a Pashtun, I'm a Baloch, right? Uh, I'm a Punjabi. The way to change it is to, to broaden those schemas, right? To think in humanistic terms. And if we incorporate those self-serving narratives, which are broader, which incorporate others in it, then you change the anthropocentric identity. Facts are not going to change it. The change will have happen here, and a humanistic education is crucial to that. I have quite a few lectures on that. Sania, thank you. I think she, she's talking about oh occupational and settler colonialism. So I have a video on settler colonialism, but the main distinction is uh, most of the times when we are talking about post-colonialism, the colonists came, they plundered, they ran these nations and then went back. The settler colonial nations are Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada. Uh, These are some of the nations where the European settlers came, but then they settled. So that's why the distinction is important to make what kind of colonialism is it? Is it settler? Because settler colonialism unleashes its own uh, problems for the native populations and what happens to them. Okay, so AC, please, sir, can you make a list of all these wonderful reading recommendations? I'm not able to type. Well, uh, the best way to read, if you want a list, I have a comprehensive list on my website. And if you go to postcolonial, um, dot net. Let me put it here. And go to, there is a link which says POCO resources. All the way to the bottom of the li- links, you'll see a list, a reading list for my PhD students. And most of these books are listed there. But when I post an edited version of it, I'll see what I've promised if I remember it, and I'll put it here. Uh, okay, sir, can you please share a link of the pedagogical lecture series? Just go to the channel and type in in the channel search, you know, pedagogy of the oppressed, or look at the playlists, and there'll be one playlist which is on pedagogy of the oppressed by Paulo Freire. Okay, so Sonia Shah, from where you gather this much optimism? Uh, Well, I'm actually not an optimist, I'm a realist, but when you work on the borders of cultures, right, when you're up against the machine of capital and religious fundamentalism, uh, what is it that you can do as a human being? You know, you can't change the world. You can't fight against these inexorable inexor- forces alone, right? But one thing you can have is say, I will not give in. You know, I will stand up to you and I will fight my little puny battles and I'll try to build solidarities. 
um, I mean, the world is out there as it is right now is to crush us, right? The question is, how do we respond to that, right? So some people take solace in religion, right? Which is great because it gives them courage. It gives them hope. I'm not a religious person, so I can't do that. So how do I sustain myself? You know, I go and, give, you know, be extra kind to people I love you know, which is my wife, my dog, and my cats right now, right? Then you go and ex see who is it whose life can be impacted by the limited power you have, right? So those are your students. They depend on you. So you try and make sure that you don't harm them, that you're extra generous and kind to them. And then if you are in a classroom, how do you conduct yourself? Do, do you encourage your students to talk? Are you generous in sharing your knowledge? All of these things, when you do them, what does it do for you? It, it makes you feel good, right, superficially. But it also gives you hope because no matter what's happening in the world, you're not just sitting there brooding and telling yourself the world is doomed. You're actually doing the little good that you can do, right? And that's how you stay positive and optimistic, right? And that's how you keep fighting for another day for change. We all are always behind in our reading, you know. If 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 you if I could show you the shelf on to the left of me, here are these are the two books that I just picked up tomorrow, yesterday, to reread because there are things in them that I need to know. Uh, but we are always behind. There there is no end of reading. There is no end of knowing. Even the greatest scholars have this problem. So, you know, get in line. So, S.K. Nijmatullah. As postmodernism question, the meta narratives, but post colonialism somehow depends on meta narratives like Said, Baba, and Spivak. Well, I mean, uh, the grand narratives or meta narratives both depend on that. I mean, in postmodernism, the technique of meta narrative, meta fiction, is different from grand narratives. The meta fictional part of a post colonial novel, a postmodern novel, would be where the novel within the story, the narrator explains the story itself. Dear reader, I am now going to take you to the house of so-and-so. In the 19th century novel, that used to be the metafictional part of the novel, where an authorial voice or a narrator pointed to where the action is going. In a postmodern novel, the metafictional part of the novel would be when a novel points to the narrative itself. Right. A great example of that, I always use it, is Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. It starts with a metafictional part. You have just bought a novel by Italo Calvino. Right. That's the first line of the novel. Right. Uh, in terms of meta narratives, now in postmodernism, if you go by Leotard, the idea is that the, the grand narratives of history are no longer sustainable. I mean, they are not sustainable because the grandness of the, those narratives was built on exclusions, right? But you could have a grand narrative of reason by excluding the aesthetic, the realm of the feeling, and by denigrating it or con considering it, you know, inferior. You could have a grand narrative of civilization by positing civilization as a teleological mo movement to the present, but by silencing the stories of all the casualties of that, the grand narrative of capital, right? So what it is replaced with is these petite narratives, right? And within that, how? Because women entered politics, because you know, minorities have started writing. Their voices are finally being heard. So when you have all these voices coming in, what are they trying to complicate? What stream of history are they trying to enter? The, the stream from which they were excluded. So if they're entering into it and bringing their stories to it, 
that narrative that was built on exclusions is already become untenable, right? Now, what it doesn't mean is that there is this, everyone has their own stories. After all, we are all overdetermined by the world in which we live, right? And it's politics. So by and large, we do form, form these affinity groups with the same politics and same ideas. Uh, so, but my argument is that while uh, the idea might be that there are no longer grand narratives, the idea isn't that there are no longer grand narratives. The idea is that their hold has weakened. But that's also a very Eurocentric idea. I mean, when I look at the periphery, so-called, the Islamic world, India, the older grand narratives are having a resurgence, right? Now, and the challenges to them are being increasingly weakened, right? Now, within those grand, grand narratives, of course, is the appearance of being a grand narrative. You know, if you look at Pakistan, if you just use Islam, first of all, as it's a symbolic grand narrative because somehow the Pakistanis have led themselves to believe that Islam made Pakistan, right? Uh, secondly, within that, there is a monolithic view of what Islam is, not realizing that there is, first of all, a Shia-Sunni divide, then not realizing that amongst the Sunnis, there is Deobandi and Brailvi divide, and to a point that sometimes they would not pray in each other's mosques. So that grand narrative of Islam itself is riven with the petite narratives of different interpretations. If you go to India, there is the grand narrative of dharma and Hinduism and BJP has picked up that slogan, not realizing that there are about you know, 25 million Adivasis and, uh, and Dalits who are challenging that grand narrative, right? Uh, and that then there are minorities, Muslims and Christians and Sikhs and Hindus. So, so all those grand narratives are offering themselves as as solution to our ultimate problems and as singular narratives. But the, they are constructed through force, through ideology, through discourse, right? Through fear, right? You take away the fear and allow people to question the narratives, you will get a different kind of narrative. I think that's the difference, in my opinion. Uh, okay, so so while you are coming up with more questions, the idea then the post, if we look at the intersectionality of the postmodern and the postcolonial, just as there is no one singular way of defining postmodernism, there is no singular way of constituting the postcolonial, but a lot of work that the postcolonial scholars do tends to be postmodern in a sense that they are probably bringing up ideas of class, of gender, of ethnic identity. They are probably sharing stories that were otherwise silenced. And then in terms of writing their texts, they are using the postmodernist te techniques. Some of them are self-reflexivity, parody, you know, pastiche, um, multiple existences, multiple ways of being, or giving us different modes of experience and living life, right? All of that falls into the postmodern. And if you go by Homi Baba's discussion, I highly recommend his chapter, then it will be a question of cultural difference. He also uses the question of language, right? And how the postcolonial authors writing about hybridity, writing about the metropolitan experience are in the process also creating something that is neither this nor that, neither modern nor pre-modern. So they are making truth itself or the idea of being in the world indeterminate and probably more international in a sense. So these are some of the things that we can think of when we think of the post-colonial and the post-modern. That I have also started um, tra transferring the audio files of most of the lectures on the channel uh, to our podcast. So the podcast is also called 
post-colonial space. Uh, I'll post a link when this one comes up, but if you just go to Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, just put in post-colonial space and they carry it, it's there. I've already, I think, transferred about 56 episodes to that. And uh, and that is converting some of the video files into audio files and uploading them separately. Because quite a few people had recommended that they would love to have that. So do check into that because I would love to, you know, the more people can listen to these and share, the better it would be. Um, I have another question, AC. From my reading, I've noticed that in a post-colonial era, there seems to be a simultaneous engagement and resistance with the European canon versus one or the other. But am I wrong? Uh, well, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, the thing is, the problem with the post-colonial always has been, and which has been challenged a lot, is that despite our radical politics and our challenges to the metropolitan text, we are deeply entrenched, entrenched in that. I mean, if you look at all our major scholars, I mean, where did Homi Bhava go to school, right? Um, you know, who did he study with? Terry Eagleton, right? Uh, Spivak, right? Paul DeMont, uh, Edward Said, a product of the Western educational system. So there is nothing wrong with that. Masood Raja, you know, not a very big school, but Florida State. So that is the beauty of post-colonial studies is that you can be trained in the Western Academy. But previously, 40 years ago, all you had was, I'm going to go study Shakespeare, the way the British read him. I'm going to go study, you know, modernism. The beauty is that Post-colonialism as an established subfield of English studies enabled us to say, yeah, I'm going to take my American lit courses. I'm going to take my British lit courses. But my dissertation is going to be about texts coming from Pakistan, from India, right? Um, so what was my dissertation? There was not even a single American or British novel in it. Right? There was only one English text that I talked about in my dissertation, and that also was published in 1890s, which was called the Indian Muslims. All the other texts that I used were texts in Urdu, right? Or, and one in Farsi, right? So what this enabled us to do as scholars was use the knowledge of the places that we came from, but publish works that complicate that debate. So previously, you know, Shakespeare was studied only within the context of European history. So you could teach Tempest as a play, which is about, you know, the power of knowledge of Prospero and, and the bestiality of Caliban, right? Because that was the way European scholars read him until someone like Chin Wei Zhu comes along or CLR James and others, and it's like, no, Caliban is our hero. And they go and do research and they find out that other than Prospero, the most dialogue is that of Caliban, right? That is the post-colonialist coming in by saying, no, I am going to tell the story of Caliban. You are still working with a canonical English text right? A play by Shakespeare. So that's the difference. In my opinion, I don't think so. The post-colonialists are required to just go back to India and Pakistan and just write about their... I think the beauty is that you master the vocabularies of the metropolitan, but then you turn them against the object of your own study, you know. I am in an English department, right? But Simply by being here, by teaching the texts I teach, I have a transformative impact on this English department because I can teach texts that a traditional English department wouldn't. Now, the problem isn't here. The problem is in the post-colonies 
where the idea of English studies is still dated and Eurocentric. So if you are in India, I'm not sure what your teachers tell you. And you're in Pakistan and you want to write a dissertation about Faz Ahmed Faz or Habib Jaleb, right? Your professor will tell you that if it is not available in English translation, you cannot write a dissertation on it, right? So the, the post-colonies themselves are still Eurocentric and the discipline is Eurocentric. The American professor would never tell me. At the most, what they will tell me is, okay, we want someone on your committee who can read Urdu so that he or she can tell us that you're doing a good job of reading these texts. So that's where I would blame the scholars you know, in India, Pakistan, and elsewhere who are still maintaining the Eurocentric standards that by and large we have dismantled over here, right? To some extent. I mean, this colonial subversive to class and caste would not a goal to be dismantled. Uh, well, I mean, I am a Marxist and I love Marxism, but I have absolutely never believed that Marxism is a uh, solution to all our problems. When it suits me, I become a culturalist, maybe, you know, culturalist informed by Marx. Uh, uh, class cannot cover everything, you know. Um, there are concepts larger than that, theorized by people like Pierre Bourdieu and other. Uh, uh, class can absolutely not help you in solving the caste problem in India, right? Uh, because you can shift your class in India. You, you can rise high, uh, but still be ostracized because of your caste, right? So if class mobility could undo the damage of class, right, under capitalism. Similarly, if you have read uh, God of Small Things, a lot of people miss the point of the novel, right? One of the points of the novel is that here is a state run by the communists historically, but even in a communist run state, the barrier of class, uh, caste cannot be crossed and the consequences could be dangerous. So what happens to Veluta, despite the fact that he's member of the party, right? Right, he's killed in a police station, beaten to death because he had a relationship with a woman who would be considered higher caste, right? So I am very reluctant to accept any single system as something that can solve all our problems. I, I believe that we should take the best from whatever is available. So, so in terms of bricolage, I don't want the ideal tool. I want the hammer that will do my job, right? The job is to make this world an egalitarian and better place. I don't care if Marxism does that or if neoliberal capital does that, whichever does that is fine for me. A world in which we all can live in peace, happily, secure as equal human beings, right? With no gradations of difference in terms of our extrinsic and intrinsic value, where we are respected, you know, and can sustain our life. The debate is much more complex than that, but to simplify it, that's what I would say. Um, Sahar, don't you think that Pakistan needs to work on producing post-colonial theorists as we have many fiction writers, but we lack critics like you? Absolutely. I think the younger generation is already on the path of doing that. Uh, there are some brilliant professors in Pakistan. Pakistan's problem isn't that you don't have smart people, that you don't have dedicated people. Pakistan's problem number one is resources. If your university has a PhD program or MPhil program, but not a world-class library with resources of a world-class library, then they are just making money out of you, okay? Because, you know, they don't fund these degrees, you have to pay for them. Two, Pakistan's problem philosophically and politically is the restricted public sphere. If you are a scholar in Pakistan, uh, you can't always write what you want to write. On one side, you have to read the So if religion is also impinging on what you can write about, and the army is also doing that, or the security institutions, you just have this narrow little path. 
of trying to articulate something original or something revolutionary. So I I have never believed and I will never believe that Pakistan does not have the people with the intellect and the desire and drive to do things. I think the problem is infrastructural and that we have increasingly created an intolerant public sphere. And these are the consequences of that. And the problem is that the people who are in power, who think that they can somehow cobble together a modern nation by telling people what to do and by curbing their initiatives, no, you can't do that. You cannot create a strong, vibrant national space without vibrant thought, without the freedom to say what you want to say, freedom to write what you want to write. No one has ever been able to create that. Um, and even if they do, it will be an artificial, you know, development like that of China, right? Make millions of people slaves to the corporations and you have the China model. What do you think that means for those of the African diaspora? I read in the empire right backs that it always results in a surge. Well, not just empire rights back, as I already said, I will take it with a grain of salt. Remember, there is not just African diaspora. The, the, there in America, of course, there are African-American writers. There are African-American scholars. It's a subfield of study in English department. It's, it has its theories. It has its own modes of representation. But in pretty much all diasporic writing, there is always, you know, a quest, a search. In African American writing, earlier 1970s and 60s, there was a quest for origins because here were people who were deracinated, right, and who had no immediate contact with where they came from. Sometimes they didn't even know the history of where they came from. So one of the quests was to get in touch with their African roots imaginatively and all. But by and large, you know, most diaspora communities have their own struggles, but the struggles are always of inclusion, right? And inclusion not into an ideal main, you know, flow of history, but inclusion as equal, valuable human beings, and by the process then altering the main culture in which you exist. Uh, Kamal Jo, how do you view the current farmers' protest in India? Do you see it as a resistance against the internal imperialist? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I haven't read much details, but any time, look, there are always global imperatives to privatize. You know, in Pakistan, we have a privatization office. The idea is somehow, which is being sold to us, that private enterprise is more efficient, government is, uh, uh, you know, less efficient and more corrupt. But the farming industry subsistence farming or large farming, both in India and Pakistan, is one of the most precarious ways of making a living, but also the most crucial to the sustenance of life, right? When, with the price controls or with the guarantees by the government, it works as an incentive because the farmers are not thrown to the whims and power of the market. And it reduces uncertainty for the farmers. If you immediately move them into a system where the, they don't know whether their crop would sell or not, whether someone would underbid, without developing a safety net, an insurance system that they can pay into, right, which covers their crop losses and all, then you are basically absolutely making them precarious. So there are two ways of guaranteeing risk, right, or reducing risk for far farmers. One is every year the government ministry sits together and says, this is going to be our lowest wheat price. This is going to be our lowest rice price. So the farmers already know, okay, next year, this is the price that we need to maintain. We can't fall below that. 
when you take that control away but don't replace it with an insurance system, then the farmers' lives have absolutely become precarious and, and the market will wipe them out, right? They'll be fighting each other, right? And, and how do you fight each other? A contractor comes to you and say, I, I need 100,000 tons of rice. I'll pay you $15 a ton. The other one, more desperate, will say, I'll sell it for 14. That's how the market works, right? Uh, so I am in solidarity with the farmers uh, on this, and I hope that they succeed. Yeah, I mean, I see it not as against the co colonialist mentality of those in power, but those in power are uh, in league with neoliberal capital. This is Mr. Modi, right? Uh, and they, they, their idea is far, agriculture is the last place where India has not liberalized. Pretty much rest of the Indian market, they've liberalized, they've industrialized, and they need, if they are going to industrialize, there's a lot of cynicism involved over here too. If they are going to industrialize, they cannot absorb this farming labor in that. The best way of absorbing farmers into that is to reduce their numbers, right? And this will reduce their numbers. Um, it is a very cynical policy in my opinion. And that's why, and it also kind of cuts in the regions where Modi doesn't have much of support. I don't think so. He won Punjab. Punjab is still with Congress. I don't know who's ruling in Haryana. These are the two main regions, agricultural breadbasket of India, right? So in a way, it is also a cynical move against the provinces where, where BJP doesn't have a lot of influence. I don't know if the farmers in the South will join them or not, but I hope they do. Uh, same is happening in Pakistan. Uh, our uh, brilliant government uh, has, uh, you know, bought into privatization as a panacea for uh, development. And, and the guy leading it is himself an industrialist. So whose interest is he going to watch out? Uh, so, all right. So I think we are now delving into quite off the topic subjects. Uh, but overall, this is what we do pretty much every Saturday. Now, do keep in mind that the first three Saturdays are open sessions. And then the fourth Saturday, I do uh, an exclusive session for those uh, who are members of the channel. And uh, we did one last month, but no one came. So I'll, tr I'll try to announce it in advance. Uh, I haven't yet decided the topic for next week. So... You can share whatever you choose. Um, we always start with a focused topic, but then you know it delves into different things because of the questions that they, that come. Uh, uh, so I'm going to sign off. I think we have gone for longer than an hour. Uh, but before I go, do remember that we do have a podcast. Uh, just look on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts for Postcolonial Space, and it will show up. And other than that, anytime you have any questions, please post them in the community tab of the channel, and I will try to address them. I would also like to let you know that some of the things that people suggest I should record lectures on are way beyond my area of expertise. And, and if they are beyond my area of expertise, I am not going to delve into that because then I won't be giving you, you know, my best effort. So that's all from me. Um, please take care of yourselves. And, you know, um, um, and yes, AC, you can, you can access the same link. I will leave this there, but I also always upload an edited version of the video too, so that we can cut out the parts that, you know, that make the video longer. But yes, you can absolutely access uh, these videos again and again. All right. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you so much for joining me. And I will now see you next week. And as always, you know, until then, peace and love.